Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Jeremy Parker. Jeremy, how are we doing? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited about this one, folks, because this one's a very unique uh, entrepreneurial endeavor. It's actually something I think every single one of us has probably uh, in, been either interacted with or had some sort of thing. Like if you go to a conference, you tend to come home with this. We're going to be talking about swag. But before we get into all that, Jeremy, go ahead and introduce yourself. Who is Jeremy Parker? Uh, great to be here. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, a lifelong entrepreneur. Uh, I used to be a documentary filmmaker in my past life. But for the last what 18 years since I graduated college, I was starting businesses. Uh, some have succeeded, some have failed. But I'm a, uh, I guess, a lifetime entrepreneur. It's, it's a lifetime sport. And I'm, you know, constantly learning and trying to get better every day. Okay, now I, I got I to gotta ask. Documentary films. Tell me how you got into that. And then how did you, what was your first entrepreneurial endeavor? Sure thing. Yeah, so I went to a college for filmmaking. I went to Boston University. When I was 18 years old, I made this feature-length documentary called 1% uh, that, that actually won the Vail Film Festival. So I was 18 years old. I was on the top of the mountaintop. I win this big film festival. There's a lot of major celebrities that everyone's heard of, a lot of more struggling uh, creatives, artists. And I asked myself like two questions. Really, number one, do I love what I'm doing? And, and number two, am I that good at it? And honestly, both answers were no. And it was kind of this realization, even though I just won this big film festival, that maybe this is not the career that I should be pursuing or that was the right choice for me. So went back to college, finished up my last year in college, and I had no other experience except for being a filmmaker, but I, I wanted to learn what I was good at, so I started my first company. I had no experience, uh, didn't really even know what entrepreneur meant, but I picked a t-shirt company to start because I thought that could be easy. Um, it wasn't, um, <laughs> but I, I thought it could be relatively easy, and also I thought I would learn a lot what I was good at, what I was bad at, what I enjoyed, because if you think about like a t-shirt company, you're, you have to learn how to manufacture and you have to learn how to do PR and sell to stores. And this is pre Shopify, like build an e-commerce experience and create a brand and all these different aspects of creating a business it is simple t-shirt company. So I launched this t-shirt company uh, called Tees and Tats, horrible name, um, but it was based <laughs> on like tattoo apparel. And the t-shirts were, you know, 200 plus dollar t-shirts individually numbered, very high end premium. Um, we were selling to all these different stores and um, it was going great until 2007 recession hit and all the stores we were selling to kind of went under. So it was kind of one of these like moments of, is my business going to fail like right as we're starting it? And that kind of just led me on to have to think out of the box and creatively because, you know, when a business is failing, you really have to figure out like the, the side door uh, type of experience. And I wrote a letter to Mark Cuban who is a obviously famous Mark Cuban billionaire, but he had a blog called Blog Maverick. And I was trying to learn as much as I could in the early days of my entrepreneurship journey. And he responded to my, my message and he wrote about me in this blog. And it kind of set me on this, this path of, I met this person and that person. And ultimately, I met this guy, uh, Elliot Pizer, who is the CEO of MV Sport. And MV Sport is a very large company in the promotional product space. And it introduced me to this industry that I never heard of, when I was 22 years old, and I don't want to bore you. There's so many ups and downs, but basically, I, I kind of discovered this industry, and uh, I fell in love. So that was kind of how I got into this promo industry. Yeah, I, I love it. Because first and foremost, it's, it's really interesting because I also, I think my first entrepreneurship endeavor was also the t-shirt uh, industry. And, and I tell you, I got my butt kicked and my, and my wallet cleaned out. And, and to your point, because uh, there are so many nuances in the, the t-shirt industry with dealing with suppliers and dealing with, you know, supply and logistics and then dealing with actual vendors and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, kind of like you, I actually had to go back to school because I'm realizing, you know, I'm I'm trying to, uh, you know, trying to teach people how to cook. Yeah, I've never took a cooking lesson before. And mm -hmm. so like, it makes sense to kind of go back. And I love your uh, thought process of, of networking, reading blogs, uh, and reaching out folks. I, I got to tell you, in fact, Mark Cuban says this pretty consistently. Um, if you, if you have, if you kind of bring them something of value or something he's interested, he's willing to reach out to you, even though he's super busy. Uh, he's, he's an individual that actually wants to see entrepreneurs succeed and he's willing to kind of lend some support. Now you mentioned, you know, you, you just kind of reached out and you've been networking. How important has networking been to you in your career? It's, I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's a big, a big part of the success I've had is different experiences and 
you don't always know when you're in the experience, is this could be valuable or not? It's not about that. It's about, you know, forming connections. I think it's just important in general to learn from one another, um, learn from people who have done it before you and see their mistakes and how you can maybe avoid those mistakes or see what they did that was right. Maybe you can learn from it. So in all my, all my experiences, even when, even through the failures, oftentimes the failures taught me more than the successes. If that makes sense. Um, I'll give you a quick, quick example. I, uh, when I was 25 years old, I started a company with my brother and we did like product placement for YouTube videos. So my brother had this idea, what if we could get these big brand names uh, into YouTube videos? Now everyone's doing that, right? The YouTube stars are millionaires at this point, but I'm 39. This was 14 years ago, if you can imagine. Um, people weren't doing that. And these YouTube stars were getting millions and millions of views and they were making no money. They were living in their parents' basement. So my brother had this idea. What if you could put these brands, State Farm, Colgate, Verizon, into the YouTube videos, become kind of like the middleman, their agency, and take like a brokerage fee, if you will. And it became very successful. And then I joined my brother and we said, well, why are we stopping with just YouTube stars? Why don't we do this with major celebrities who have millions of followers or will have millions of followers on social media? So we started buying up the celebrity rights to, and I can't say the names, but major celebrities on their Twitter and Facebook. Like they could only do deals through us. We were becoming like their broker. And put in perspective how early we were, it was like a celebrity that now has like 40 million followers had like 4,000 followers when we bought their rights. So it's kind of like buying oil before people knew how valuable oil was. And we packaged this deal up and I ultimately sold it to a publicly traded company by the guy, Bob Sillerman, uh, creator of Live Nation, Ticketmaster, acquired my company when I was 25 years old. And then after that, I had a different startup that was a failure. It took me three years. We never really made it successful. It was called Vouch. It was a social networking app. And I learned the biggest takeaway from that failure. And I'll explain right now. I was you know, in charge of products. So user experience design, that's you know, part of my background. I'm a filmmaker, but my, part of my background is also user experience and design. I lost sleep over every little thing. Like what the, feed, what the app should look like. What happens when you swipe right or left? What happens if you press this button? Everything, I lost sleep over every little detail. And I spent a year building this platform and then we launched it. And when I launched it, all the things that I lost sleep over that I thought were important, users did not give a shit about. It was all these other things. There's a whole different list of stuff that they cared about. And I just, at that moment realized I just wasted a year of my life building the wrong thing. And, you know, that really, you're kind of putting yourselves with like uh, handcuffs. You know, it's very hard to overcome wasting a year of burn, building the wrong thing, have to recalibrate, re we never were able to figure out the right solution. And I wished that I could just got out of my own way and built something really quickly, launched it quickly and learned and then pivoted and learned and learned. So when we started swag.com right after, uh, from day one, we started making sales. I didn't have a business. I had a, a landing page that said coming soon. And that was it. And I went and I knocked on doors and I called up Facebook and I knocked, I went to their office and I went to up and down. We work hallways, knocking on doors just trying to make as many sales and frankly learn from the customer to figure out what the right thing to build is. So that was like the biggest life lesson for entrepreneurs who are listening, get out of your own way, remove the ego. Most entrepreneurs have this, this ego that they think they know what the answer is. And oftentimes they don't. So get out of your own head, speak to people, you know, be, be comfortable sharing your idea. No one's stealing your idea. Talk about it, get it, get it out of your brain and hear how people react to it. And the reaction might not always be positive, and then we're actually might not always be right. Like they, your friends might be wrong and that's okay. But hearing from more people, the better. You'll be able to really refine the experience and build the right solution. You, you know, this is something actually we talk about pretty consistently on this show is, is, you know, we really try to encourage entrepreneurs before you go start your business plan, your marketing plan. What is your minimal viable product? And do you have an actual audience for it? You know, and, and you kind of mentioned it too. Why was it so important when you, you mentioned, you know, you wish you would have got out of your way and you would have just put out something just out there to kind of see and test it. Why is that so important? Everything. So I guess I'll give you a quick rundown. When we started Swag, I thought the initial uh, audience was the marketing teams, right? Because you think about it, there's, we knew we wanted to sell to businesses, but there's so many different divisions within a company that buy swag, right? There's the office manager, there's the marketing teams who are buying for trade shows, there's the sales teams to buy swag to their best customers and leads. And, and we thought the marketing team was the right audience because the marketing team in our mindset had the biggest budget, right? You could be going after a company that has 100 employees, but their marketing budget could be massive. They could be sending it yeah, to thousands on thousands of people. It's all about return on investment. But when we started reaching out to all these marketing managers in the early days, we realized that everyone goes after the marketing team. Like what is going to set swag.com? Uh, 
Like, how are we be different? How do we cut through the noise? There's 23,000 distributors that sell promotional products. How do we become the de facto leader? Why would they trust us versus somebody else? And when I noticed in the early days is that the office manager was really the audience that we should be going after. No one was going after the office manager. But think about this. If you're an office manager of a 100-person company, you're buying swag for the office, meaning you're giving the swag to the marketing team, to the sales team. It's like a Trojan horse within the company. It's the side door entrance. No one's going after it, but you're going to be getting your products powered by swag.com and the inner label to the marketing team. They're going to feel the quality. They're going to say, wow, my company already uses them. The quality is great. Why don't we use them? So it was like our, our, our way around the side door, and it really unlocked so many doors for us. You know, Now, swag.com, I'll give you a brief history. Uh, we grew over 100%. We work with over 18,000 businesses. You know, We're doing $40 million a year in sales. Um, we're now part of a bigger company called Custom Inc. that acquired us in 2021. But from 2016, when we launched, to 2021, we got acquired. We grew over 100% every single year. And it was just wow. because it's real focus on who the customer is. And if we know who the customer is, what is the platform that they need for their experience? So we start building features, always trying to learn from the customers what the right process to build is, what the right platform to build is, what the right product we should offer. Um, you know, really putting the customer first. That was really the mentality. Yeah, I, I love that because uh, you know, we're actually going through a similar process right now. I, we were started a nonprofit uh, business accelerator, Latino founders. Folks, you want to learn more information, visit latinofounder.com. And, and we actually just got an office space. And so this office space is for the individuals that go through the cohort, the business accelerated cohort and our pitch competitions. And we're realizing as we're starting to think about furniture, I'm like, I actually don't know what furniture I need yet because I don't know how the space is, how the individuals that the space is intended for, how they plan to use it. I know how I plan to use it, right? Mm -hmm. But again, the space isn't being created for me. It's mm -hmm. essentially being created for the individuals we help support. And to your point, it's kind of funny you you mentioned it, Jeremy. Is uh, you know I work in healthcare. I, I work a lot with the marketing team. And it, to your point, I'm kind of the one when it when it comes to the swag and it comes to actually because again, I'm the business development outreach manager for a cancer cardiovascular program. So when it comes to swag, I'm actually going out identifying what I want and I send it to the marketing team so they can go ahead and purchase it for me. But at the end of the day, it kind of to your point, uh, I'm the one that kind of makes the decision in regards to like, do I want the pen? Does I want the pads? Do I want you know, the tote bag, do I want all these other different things? Now, now you mentioned you, you started to transition into the swag.com. So tell us a little bit, what is what is swag? And why did you, how did you guys find that such a niche would be so successful? True, yes. Yeah. So I started swag.com with a co-founder of mine, Josh, in uh, 2016. So the idea was very simple. I was involved in the promo industry from early days, MV Sport. And at the time, when I was going around all the trade shows with Ellie Pizer and I, and I saw the buyer was his 45, 50-year-old office manager, right? And they bought everything through catalogs, presentation decks, back and forth emails. It was a very fragmented way to do sales. But I just figured back then, maybe the buyer doesn't you know, want to go on an e-commerce experience. Why don't they? You fast forward 10 years, the industry only got bigger and bigger and bigger, but the buyer changed. It was this weird dynamic. It was like an aha moment. The swag buyer is now a 22-year-old. But the process for buying swag was still the old fragmented manual process of catalogs, presentation decks. And I figured that a 22-year-old doesn't want to buy it that way. They probably want to go onto the e-commerce site, find what they're looking for, upload their logo, mock things out, price things in real time, check out. So that was the initial idea. It was just building today's platform for the modern buyer. It was taking like swag to the next level. Um, and then from there, obviously, a lot of other ideas have started coming. Well, what does the modern buyer like? What does a millennial want? They don't want to be looking through a thousand mugs. They want to see the top 20. So then we started doing curation and we started doing quality control and really refining exactly what our vision, our thesis was, but it all stemmed from who we thought the core buyer was, the shift in the mentality. Um, and we started to launch and we launched the first version of the site. We had no customers. We had no money. It was me and my co-founder, Josh, knocking on doors. We were legitimate traveling salesmen to get those early customers. So in the early days, it was about getting some customers in the door to make some money, but it was more even about learning and getting those logos. We, we fashioned ourselves logo hunters. So we, we felt like our business was really dependent on social proof. Like if people came to swag.com and they saw a row of logos of Facebook, Google, WeWork, all these companies use us, we would use them too. So right. instead of trying to go start from the bottom and work your way up to those big brands, our first customer was Facebook. 
Our second customer is WeWork. Our third customer is Bravo TV. We started with who are, where are millennials connecting to and what are the brands that would give them the confidence to ultimately buy from us, whether, whatever startup they work for. So that was the mentality. And we got these row of logos on the homepage. And then we discovered that the office manager was the right audience. This took 500 plus conversations with marketing teams and different people within the company to really dissect that. Dissect that. And then once we figured that office managers were the right audience, we dug in and we interviewed so many office managers to try to understand what types of products they want. What's their normal experience? What's the use case of their swag? How often do they buy swag throughout the year? All these different decisions and input allowed us to build the right solution. So in 2017, a year after we officially launched um, with a landing page, we launched the first version of the e-commerce site. And we went from 350,000 our first year doing it manual to 1.1 million our second year to 3.1 million to 7 million to 15.5 to 30 million. And then we got acquired by Custom Inc. So we really grew so fast because we always had the customer um, mentality in mind. Everything that we built, we felt very good that we weren't just spending tech time building something and that hopefully it works. We knew it was going to work because our clients were telling us. Let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about scaling a little bit because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, I I, I think you know the the core they would love to be able to scale a hundred x year over year for five yeah. six years. Yeah. However, their biggest concern operations. How did you scale your organization hundred x year over year, but maintain the operational fluidity that it needs to make sure you're running a successful company? It is it is very challenging. You know, in the early days. As an entrepreneur, you're the CEO, right? But you're also head of operations, you're head of marketing, you're head of sales, you're head intern, you're making deliveries, uh, legitimately doing everything. So before you ever hire anybody, you should feel the pain yourself. You should know what all the roles specifically do. So we only made our first real full-time hire uh, like 18 months after we launched. And we by the time we had like year three, I think we only had four or five people and we were doing over $3 million in sales with a very small team we built a lot of technology to streamline the process. So a lot of the problems um, that required a lot of handholding, operational handholding traditionally in the industry, we kind of solve for it through um, technology. And like when we couldn't solve through technology, I would jump in there and kind of manually place orders with suppliers. Um, it's, it's, it's a, there's, I guess there's no 100% right answer for every business, every business is different. For my, my, my mentality was always, let me push myself to the extreme, like in terms of doing everything. Like, let me be in every single role and push my, until I physically cannot do it anymore. And then I need to train somebody else. And when you train somebody else and I onboard somebody, you kind of have to remove your ego and that micromanagement um, tendency that everyone, every entrepreneur has when they kind of pass it off to somebody else. Whoever you hire is not going to do it exactly like you. And that's fine. But if they do it 80% like you or 80% good, that's fine. It's the only way you can, it's a huge unlock because a lot of my entrepreneurial friends, even myself in the early days, I did do the micromanaging. I did try. And then you kind of have to stop yourself and you're saying it's never going to be an enjoyable place to work. You're never going to be able to scale where you need to scale. You start to have to rely on people. Um, you have to train them. You have to hold people accountable, but you have to, at some point, allow them to do things their own way. It doesn't have to be exactly your way. So once I learned that we were able to scale up, now we have, you know, over a hundred employees, and things are running really smoothly, and but it took time to get there and really figure out the right process. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think you know you know, you mentioned uh, encouraging entrepreneurs to kind of roll up their sleeves and, and do the do the tasks that you're asking your employees to do because uh, you are kind of the jack of all trade, master of none when you're first starting out your business. But it's also like you mentioned earlier, the learning that you actually acquire by doing all these different activities. Uh, like for example, I'm doing this podcast, folks. I'm the marketing, I'm the sales, I'm the recorder, I'm the editor, I'm all these things, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, all the things I'm learning is, is is quite remarkable. And it kind of reminds me of the book, The Lazy CEO, where it's like, you know, really encouraging uh, the CEO is really like, you know, once you, once I kind of train somebody, and you kind of mentioned it too, you know, getting the right people on the bus. Once you get those right people on the bus, and if you have policies and operational procedures that really align to make sure you have good work, like like you know, Jeremy is mentioning, 80% is better than zero. Folks, like, uh, again, because that's actually 80% of your time that you're getting back. So, okay, you have to go back for maybe do 20%. That's okay. I'd rather do 20% than the entire 100, right? And so, so being able to mix and match like that. And then, and also, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, it, you're never going to get like the 100% uh, of what you're expecting out of that role. But the beauty of it is when under, other individuals, you know, with that diverse background and different thought processes, 
they will come with other uh, you know insights and information that maybe you didn't see or overlook totally. that can totally. kind of help right a hundred percent there's so many ideas that you know my team comes up with that i wouldn't even think about so i think just being a leader you have to be open-minded i think the main kind of thought process and this is a kind of a different mentality but when you're an entrepreneur there is ego involved that is 100 yeah, percent, and you kind of have to remove the ego as much as you can um to build the right solution but there's also ego that comes in the other aspects you know if i i'm sure i'm not the only one you know as an entrepreneur it's a very lonely sport typically yeah, yes. and most people you meet on the day-to-day -day basis will probably think you're unemployed that's kind of the, the right. gist right you meet with so many people people don't think you're even doing anything oh it's not a real company so typical entrepreneurs, and I've seen this with myself included, as well as friends, you try to validate yourself through uh, external things. Like for example, you, you want to get written up in a, in a tech stars or a blog, right? Because that gives people like, oh, Jeremy's actually doing something here. Or you want to raise money from a, v a VC to get that, that confidence boost or saying, oh, they're, they're actually building something. They're not like an unemployed person. This is a real thing. And a lot of people do things for the wrong sake. Now, if PR and getting into articles and doing podcasts help the business, then you should do it. 100% you should do it. But if it's just for ego, it's such a waste of time. It's not going to move the needle. It's not going to do anything for you. It actually could even hurt you uh, in more cases. Like some, some businesses take money from VCs and don't even need the money. So I think the entrepreneur mindset, you have to have some ego because you're doing something crazy and trying to reinvent the future. But at the same time, you have to. it's kind of the balancing act of checking your ego and not allowing it to, to win. Like you got, there's this kind of this dichotomy and this balance you have to figure out. Yeah. You know, that's a great point. Cause you, you mentioned it earlier too, not only with uh, you know, certainly entrepreneurs, we have our ego, but also, you know, the sharing the idea piece, I think that's kind of where the ego comes into play as well, where we, we, we're reluctant to share our business idea because we believe somebody else is going to steal it. And, but at the, at the end of the day, folks, if, if somebody else isn't doing it. I mean, at the end of the day, the difference between you and somebody else is you're going to do it versus them. Uh, everybody, my, my general gestalt is somebody probably has that idea as well. Uh, the same idea as you I might, again, I mentioned my first clothing line was a uh, SLM apparel. And what I was really focusing on was trying to create a new way of t-shirts because I, every time I buy an extra large, it's super wide, fits me like a sleeping bag, but then a large shirt's a little too short, fits me like a tube top. And so I was really trying to recreate the way we would, uh, you know, look at shirts and another company recently come out. I'm pretty sure some of you are familiar with untucked, very mm -hmm. similar concept. They did a much better at marketing than I did. Right. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, but you know, and, and it's kind of just interesting how you're trying to like scale businesses and do all these things. But one of the things you also said that previously to swag, your first company, you actually were acquired, uh, of that company. Mm -hmm. What's it like to sell a company? Um, well, there's difference. You know, the first company I sold when I was 25 years old, um, I didn't fully appreciate it because the acquisition happened so quickly after launch. It was, it was, I didn't feel the pain. Like it was all success from the moment we started to the moment we got sold. And it was, it was a relatively small acquisition price. So it was life-changing for me as a 25 year old, but it wasn't like life-changing for, you know, for a full-time life. Uh, Swag.com happened to sell for a lot more. It was a much bigger uh, business when we sold and it wasn't an easy business. It wasn't like from the moment we started, it was success all the way. Yes, we did grow 100%, but to get that, we had, there were so many things, so many learnings, so many ups and downs. We had to fight through COVID when all trade shows, all offices are closed and no one's buying swag. And yet that same year, when the whole industry dropped 40%, we grew over 100%. How's that possible? Because we figured out ways of like, well, if no one's buying for the office, no one's buying for trade shows, why don't we create a system to individually allow people to distribute swag to their remote employees and keep the company culture thriving? If people are not going to that trade show to meet their clients, why don't we allow them to send swag across the country to say, thank you, we're still thinking of you. So having to really pivot and figure out what's the, you know, when everyone else during COVID was kind of like hunkering down and trying to survive, we thought this was an opportunity to grow and it worked. We went from seven and a half million to over 15 and a half million. And then we continued to over 30 million the following year. So when we sold, Swag.com, it was a very, it was a, a crazy feeling. I can't even describe it because we did overcome so many challenges. And I had that three-year failure right before Swag.com. I know how hard it is to build a company and that it doesn't always work out. So it was a, it was an amazing feeling. Um, and I was the CEO of Swag.com up until last December under Custom Inc., the parent company. And I went to my boss, the CEO of Custom Inc., and I said, Instead of me being the CEO of swag.com, at this point, we have 140 people. Uh, we have a lot of it, the process is all down. It's just it's about optimization. 
Uh, it's not what I love to do. I love to create and invent the future. It's not about like optimizing and making something slightly better. It's about creating something that didn't exist beforehand. And I pitched them the idea of swag space. So that's kind of, I guess, where you get the swag space, where it's a very, I think it could be an amazing idea and it's already starting to work, but it's going to take time. D is very simple. There's 23,000 promo distributors in the, in the industry. Swag.com is one of them. Swag.com happens to be one of the larger ones that's doing you know, tens of millions of dollars a year. The average promo distributor is a mom and pop. They're doing you know, between $200,000 and a million in sales. They are very fragmented. They're still selling swag the old school way, uh, but it's still the current way. Uh, you know, presentation decks, back and forth emails, phone calls to close sales, no e-commerce experience, no ability to kit boxes, nothing, no technology. And frankly, it's going to be very hard for them to compete because the buyer and buyer is getting younger and they don't necessarily want to do things in the old school way. Yeah, very so true. our idea is, what if we have this amazing technology? I spent tens of millions of dollars of this tech reinvesting the profits over the last nine years. What if I white labeled it, swag.com's tech, and I gave it for free to all the promo distributors in the world? Think of it that way. So now Jenny Promo, who never had technology, now has instantaneously and for free the best e-commerce experience in the industry. And it doesn't say swag.com. It doesn't say swag space. It doesn't say custom ink. It says Jenny Promo, right? It's her site. And when the order happens through her site, it hits my back end. And I de facto become the number one supplier. So no more do I need Jenny Promo have to collect the money through invoice and buy blank t-shirts there and send to a screen printer and buy notebooks from there or get a consolidator. We remove 90% of the work. We're making the entire experience really frictionless and we're allowing them to scale in a true way. Um, and we're kind of putting ourselves at the center of the industry, like building that tech layer in between the $23 billion worth of revenue and the suppliers, we become the de facto supplier. So that's kind of what the big idea is. And this idea is also valuable for anyone who wants to start a business. If they wanted to create a swag company, if you're a graphic designer and you create a logo for somebody and that person takes that logo and goes to a custom ink or somebody else, why don't they go through you and you make sales? If you're a screen printer that wants to add hard goods, notebooks, pens, mugs, except for t-shirts, you could do that. Event planners, you know, your clients are buying swag for their events. Why don't they go to you to buy swag? Now we allow anyone to do it, to sell it. And we also handle all the complications of the process that we spent the last nine years building. So it's uh, we just launched officially in January, really by April of this year. So we're still very, very new. Um, we just broke 100,000 for the first time in a month last in August. So we're really starting to, the, the volume starting to really pick up here. It, it's man, that is a, such an awesome idea. Swag space, folks. Uh, again, yeah. you can learn more about this on the shadesv.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. We'll have this information on there. But the reason I really like this is, it's almost like Etsy on steroids, right? Because Etsy is a platform where entrepreneurs go, except to your point, they kind of have to do all the, the hard work at the end. They have to connect with the vendors and all these other folks. You're really kind of giving your entrepreneurs a space to say, okay, you want to create a business. Let us help you curate that business, uh, which I really, really think is a valuable tool. Um, because again, it's it's I think that's the difficulty of entrepreneurship as well is, is you can really go, you know, head first into all these different softwares that do they're very valuable right you have google you have website you have all these other things but then the the amount of money that goes into that and especially when you're getting into product or service it it tends the operational costs tend to go up pretty quickly and you're kind of alleviate some of that a lot of it i mean they have no tech costs whatsoever our tech is is the best tech in the industry and they have it instantaneously no more of having to figure out if suppliers good we've already done all the vetting we're connecting all the supply, the printers, the notebooks to the pad printers. Everything is fully connected. It allows the entrepreneur to just make sales. That's their business. Their business is to make sales. They could go to all the different coffee shops in their area, they, all the local churches and synagogues. They can make sales to any corporate B2B company, any business they can make sales to. And we power the entire process of the catalogs, the presentation decks to the checkout flow. And we make it really streamlined. Oh, I love it. Now, let's take a step back because you kind of started your entrepreneur endeavor in a very unique time where e-commerce wasn't really a thing, yet yeah. you were kind of tasked to create an e-commerce. Let's talk about some of the difficulties you had beginning kind of starting uh, where there wasn't really an e-commerce space and how have you kind of learned to evolve and actually really took what you learned, you know, 10 years ago and apply it today? Yeah, when we were starting Tees and Tats, my first business, uh, Shopify didn't exist. Uh, at least I didn't know. I wish I did know. I mean, there was, there was nothing. We had to really hire developers. I had to create a full-on user experience for this company and build it. And it took like six months to build. Like things that, you, that entrepreneurs take for granted today, you could spin up a site in a day 
took six months and thousands upon thousands of dollars yeah. uh, to do. And it wasn't even nearly as good of what you have with Shopify with all the plugins and all the widgets and everything. So, I mean, it was actually funny when we started swag.com 10 years later, we're like, well, I'm not, I'm never building a new site again. I'm just going to use Shopify. <laughs> right? I didn't want to deal with anything. And we started to build swag.com on Shopify and we built it, spent four months building it, spending all this time because we had to do some customization things. Like we, like we had, cause it's, all the pricing is dynamic pricing, right? It takes into consideration the quantity that you're buying, how many print locations, number of colors in the print. And then the developers came back to us and said, hey, all the things that we thought we could do with Shopify, we can't really do that last piece, which is the dynamic pricing aspect. After spending literally months trying to do it, they couldn't figure it out because uh, Shopify didn't have a simple plugin for that, that use case. And we realized we had to actually scrap all of it, wasted four months, and we had to start building it from the ground up. And I was like, I cannot believe I have to rebuild entire site it like brought me back 12 years previous um but we did it and actually it, it i'm very lucky and i'm blessed that we built it on our own because so many things on our site are so custom and unique to us it's so like for example when facebook uploads their logo we built a technology that can not only detect how many colors are in their logo but what the nearest panto match is right that's very important there's like think of web colors there's unlimited there's bazillion colors that could be when you're looking at the screen but a Pantone book, I don't know if you've ever seen a Pantone book, it's like a couple of hundred colors. Yep. So how do you equate a web-based color to a Pantone color that's actually being printed on apparel? We developed a technology that could do that could turn a web-based into a Pantone. Like all these things that streamline the entire process um, wouldn't be possible if we used a Shopify or a plugin type thing. So we really had to build our own, build our own inventory database and warehousing and all these different things. So it really allowed us to stay ahead of the curve because we're always building things that nobody else had. It was all kind of futuristic, but it allowed our customers a much better experience and it allowed our operations team a really much more streamlined experience to actually be able to fulfill orders in a real, you know, efficient way. We scale from 7 million to 15 million to 30 million with the same exact number of employees in terms of the operations team. So it wasn't like we need to hire so many people. Our system did a lot of the work for us. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, that was one of the biggest kind of takeaways for me in the the clothing line industry was the dynamic pricing is kind of important because folks, I'm not sure if you know this, but when you actually do screen printing, every color, uh, additional color on a shirt is additional cost. So if you just do one color, just black, okay, that's this cost. Okay, now you're gonna add red, you're gonna add blue, you're gonna, so all these things start to add up. Uh, but then it's also the quality of your shirt, right? The thickness of your shirt, the amount of blends it has versus cotton versus spandex versus all these different iterations. Uh, and then the company you purchase it from, you outsource it from, and then the number of volumes. So if you get more, you get a discount. And, and uh, it, it is it's quite unique um, kind of going through that process. And and I like the way you mentioned, Je uh, Jeff, uh, uh, Jeremy, in, in regards to the um, really going through it and realizing like, you know what? I, this is an issue that we have that mm -hmm. Topify can't solve it. So you not only did you solve it yourself, but then you said, you know what, we solved it and we actually created something better that we can now lend out to other entrepreneurs so they can now use, so they can scale their business. That's exactly right. And it's a weird dynamic. And everyone's saying, I can't believe you're giving this away to your quote unquote competitors, right? Because that's the mentality. Like we're all in the same industry. We're all selling the same types of products. I, I don't think of it that way. I mean, the, the industry is so big. It's yeah. so massive. I'm never going to win Jenny Promo's customers. Yeah. Like Jenny Promo has a relationship with their customers. I'm not looking to steal our customers and they don't want to work with the swag.com because if they did, they already would have been working with us. So what I want to do is I want to give the technology so that Jenny can do her business a lot better, a lot more efficient. The technology is not to replace the human connection that Jenny has with her clients. It's to automate it. It's to streamline it. It's for Jenny to now use technology to say all this work that I was spending hours and days of work to close a deal. Now I can spend minutes. What can I do with that extra time? Can I make more sales? Can I have a vacation with my family? Can I relax a bit? Like, let let Jenny decide what she wants to do with her life. Yeah. But now she at least has technology that could, could help her. Now, now Swag Space is a essentially a new a new kind of venture outside of the Swag.com. Although it's kind of vertically integrated, right? It's kind of the piece of, into it, but it's kind of a software, right? Yep. How do you now instead of it being kind of an online, you know, you you have a target audience you mentioned was which was like you know office managers. Who is your target audience for swag space and how do you market it? Yeah, that's, that is the, that is the challenge. That is the question, right? Like custom Inc is a big company doing $650 million a year in sales, acquire swag.com 
Swag.com is a division under Custom Inc. Swagspace is also now a new division under Custom Inc. And we're leveraging the technology as well as the back-end operations of Custom Inc. So when the order happens on Custom Inc., Swag.com, or Swagspace, it all hits the back-end of Custom Inc. Because they're the, the behemoth, you know, helping us power it. But the audience is very different, right? Swag.com's audience is Amazon, Google, office managers, marketing teams, sales teams, et cetera. Swagspace is selling to people who want to sell swag. So who would want to sell swag? It's the 23,000 promo distributors. That's one audience. It's the 20,000 event planners in the US. It's the hundreds of thousands of graphic designers in the US. It's the entrepreneur who's like, wow, I could start a business overnight in seconds for free. Let me do that. So we have actually entrepreneurs. We have an entrepreneur on our site who's never sold swag ever. And in the last three months, sold over $100,000 of swag and made $30,000 for himself. He's never didn't even know about it. But he's like, I have the best platform, the best back end. It's streamlined for me. All I have to do is make sales. Oh, I know people who work at different companies. I can convince them to be. So we built a system where you could create a, laundry, uh, um, a homepage on our site. It, everything. You could customize the URL so it says your exact brand name. It's all instantaneous. It's all free. So we're trying to figure out exactly who the right audience is. But today, it's, we're keeping a very beta we're not allowing unlimited people to get accepted where you have to apply to be accepted. And we're really just trying to refine the experience in these first few years to make sure we have the right solution for the right audience. And then eventually, once it's perfect, we're going to really start opening up to everybody. That, that is awesome. And again, folks, if you want to kind of continue to keep a track of what's going on with Swag's Place, please visit theshadesv.com, subscribe to the newsletter. We'll make sure we, we keep, you, keep you informed, uh, especially when the beta uh, is over and, and kind of open up to the public. Now, let's talk about why the, uh, beta, we kind of talked about it, minimal vial product earlier. Why is this beta so important for Swag Space to make sure you run the tweaks? Yeah, I mean, if we opened it to the public, so we have over 500 people who've applied already. We, we've, on, we've opened it to about 100 users. If we opened up to other 400 people, and if we start to market, we're not marketing this at all. We haven't spent a dot, you know, anything. We went to one trade show just to learn. We want to get in front of our customers, our potential customers, and see their pushback. Um, listen, this is the main thing. The industry, especially the promo industry, has been doing it one way for their whole life, right? They, they could be a 56-year-old person who's doing sales in this industry, and they've been riding a bicycle to work every day. Think of it this way. They're riding a bicycle to work. And when they get to work, it takes them an hour to get to work and they show up sweaty and then they ride their bike back and it's an hour back and they're sweaty and they're disgusting. And now we're saying, here, jump on a motorcycle. You're going to get to work in much faster time, but it's a little scary, right? Jumping on a motorcycle. There's some training that's involved. So we're just really trying to learn from the, from the potential users. What's the right solution? How do we position it? How do we train them? How do we get them, you know, um, ready for success. I mean, that's the big thing. We don't want people just to join the platform and then be too scared or it's overwhelming. We want people to join, to love it, to learn about it, to, sit, to use it, and then become hooked on it and then replace the other ways that they're doing things. You know, it's kind of uh, interesting because you mentioned your, your target audience, but now I'm, start, I'm starting to, you know, I'm Latino, so I got a huge family. When we think about family reunions, shit, we have like 150 people there. Mm -hmm. We buy swag, right? We, everybody, family has their own t-shirt, family, Flores, family, Guerrero, so on and so forth. Um, and then also just thinking about all the nonprofit spaces out there as well from like, yeah, it's very interesting model that you got. I'm very intrigued to kind of see how it continues. Now I'm thinking about what kind of swag can I sell out here? By the way, it's, it's, it could be a part-time thing. We thought about the same thing. There's, there's work at home dads and moms. You're like, I have a business, but you know what? I'm connected to a couple of uh, charities or to a local coffee shop or whatever. You could sell 20,000 for, and you're making 30%. So you can make an extra $6,000 that moves the needle for people. Yeah, that's yeah, that will certainly move the needle for a lot of people. And again, folks, this is I really like this concept because it's very it's kind of like all, almost like Amazon too, where they have you know you can send into their their uh, station right there, and they'll package all of their stuff and kind of do all the mm -hmm. operational stuff. They'll keep the storage, so you don't have to their fulfillment uh, system. So, folks, uh, if you I think I actually wrote about it, so go ahead and check it on the shadesv.com. Uh, I think the blog has something about the Amazon kind of fulfillment thing. Uh, but again, it's it's very interesting because you're again you're allowing and kind of encouraging entrepreneurial endeavors. One hundred percent. Now you've you've been doing this for some time. You've had a successful exit. You mentioned your fail. You, now you're doing this. You're starting to grow swag space. What's mm -hmm. what's next? What's what's the uh, on the horizon for Jeremy Parker? That's a good question. You know, for right now, I really want to um, make swag space a success. You know, my my whole thing right now, I want to I want to build something that people that could change lives in our industry. I have a lot of friends in this industry, and honestly. In the next five years, there's going to be a lot of challenge for people. 
because the younger the buyer gets, the more they're not going to want necessarily that old fragment way of doing things. And, and frankly, a lot of these people might want to retire at some point. So there's like this, 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 this position that they're in where it's like, I'm a, I'm a good retire in five to seven years. And the industry is changing so much. How am I going to figure out a solution or an exit strategy for myself? And I do believe swag space could be that plan. It could really level them up, bring them into the 21st century, and also allow them an off-ramp ultimately when they want to you know, transition to, to a retirement. Um, so I'm excited about that, but I'm an entrepreneur. So I'm, I'm sure I'm going to start another business at some point that's not within the custom ink ecosystem. That's my next business that I'm going to be 100% owner of. Um, I'm not really sure what that is yet, but I'm opportunistic and I'm always, you know, talking to people and, and seeing what, what things can be improved. And then once I have an idea, I don't expect that it's going to be the right idea. I'm going to probably want to talk to a lot of people, sell it, see the pushback, and maybe it is the right thing that I'm able to kind of figure out a path for myself. Um, what I've learned for myself as entrepreneurs, is a lot of entrepreneurs that go for the biggest, you know, grand slams. And my feeling is, I don't need a grand slam. I don't need a business that needs to be a billion dollars or zero. I'm happy with a business that has the opportunity to be a small business or it has the opportunity to be a big business. I like yeah. those businesses where it's not all or nothing. Like when I started swag.com, it could have been a $5 million business. It could have been a million dollar business or it could have been what we created, which was, you know, tens of millions of dollar business. It didn't need to be either one. And I would have been happy with any of them. So the next business I start, I want to create something that I find value that's fun for me to create. Um, and that hopefully could be successful. You know, you brought up an excellent point. I think a lot of people get into entrepreneurship because they like the, uh, they have the self-control, right? They don't want to report to anybody. They want to be their yeah. own boss, uh, which, which is a, it's a great, you know, thought to do. And I, again, I think your swag, uh, swag space, what it'll, it's really like a soft takeoff for a lot of entrepreneurs because the overhead costs is, and the, the risk isn't as high as it would be to doing all of this uh, yourself. So folks, again, check out Swag Space. Uh, again, you can read about it on theshadesofe.com, subscribe to the newsletter, but it really does kind of, it's a soft runway for you to actually, like you mentioned, you can test your idea, test your thesis. Totally. I mean, for members who want to become part of Swag Space, who want to create their own site, it's free. I mean, if you were gonna, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to get into the swag industry and you want to sell swag and you want to create an app or a website like what you're getting for free on Swagspace, it would take you nine, 10 years. I know it because I built it. Yeah. I, I mean, it takes a yeah. long time. It's a lot of money. It's tens of millions of dollars. You have to raise a lot of money. It's stress, stressful. Click of a button, upload a logo, select your brand colors. Boom, you have a site ready to go. You have, you have to typically build out a team of operators, people who convert low-res logos to high-res logos. You have to deal with it. You're using our team. Yeah. It's, it's the only thing you have to focus on now is selling. So if you want to be, if you're a salesperson, you're an entrepreneur who's a salesperson. If you're somebody who's like, this will be amazing. Let me spend the next three months doing this. Maybe let me spend the next 20 years doing this. And I want to start making money. Apply to be a member. I mean, you never know what, what could happen. You could create a really meaningful business that could become your life without having to do any of the upfront knowledge learning uh, or, or tech investment or any of it, people investment. It could be a one man show, one, you know, one woman show and, and really build something of value. Yeah. I love it. And I, again, your target audience, I feel like is, is kind of any, anybody uh, that's interested yep. now for the, like, I, again, this is such a very interesting, very novel kind of space that I'm, I'm very intrigued about. And I'm going to go ahead and check out uh, yep. swag.com now uh, for the folks that are, you know, interested in learning about more about you, they want to figure out the swag. Actually, before we do that, mm -hmm. Let's give let's give some folks a head start. What it, what would you say? Because you mentioned you know the, the audience is changing. You're getting younger. You know uh, the folks are uh, your audience. Your, your your customers are tend to be younger. They they absorb information differently. What would you say uh, say in, in in swag specifically? What is becoming the most common item that is purchased? Ooh, I think we've been actually somewhat pioneers in this. And about nine years ago, when we started. Everyone was just selling T-shirts. Because t-shirts are like you're a walking billboard yep, and every, every brand wants everyone to wear the t-shirts. And my mindset when we're starting is you don't have to, we do sell a lot of t-shirts, but it's, but you don't have to sell t-shirts to brands. Um, that's not maybe the most important thing. The most important thing is giving people a value that they actually love and that ultimately they will become an evangelist and will start marketing themselves. Like, for example, like a pair of socks. Like who sees a pair of socks except for the person putting it on, Very but true. if they love the pair of socks and they're wearing it every day, 
then they're going to see it every single day and they'll become a fan. And ultimately they'll start marketing it. Uh, we did a, a deal with Facebook where we had this really beautiful leather backpack called Nomo, Nomo London, $200, really beautiful, elegant backpacks. And we didn't put the Facebook logo anywhere on the outside of the bag because it's such a nice bag. You don't want to ruin it with like an embroidery patch of a logo. So we actually embroidered the logo on the inside of the bag. So only the people open up the bag, see the Facebook logo. It's only for the recipient. It's not for them to be a walking billboard. Um, so for me, it's just about quality items. We want to sell products that people actually want to keep. That was our ethos from the very beginning. To me, drinkware, water bottles, socks, those kind of things are more personal that you use every single day. Uh, to me, are, would I try, like to push people to buy? Because I think they'll get more value out of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. In fact, one thing I've been seeing that has possibly been one of the most useful items, as you mentioned, the value is those little circle things that you put behind your cell phones mm -hmm. that people use to stand up. Those seem to be going pretty quickly because again, folks find a value. If I'm at a conference, I cannot keep a notepad on my desk because again, they're going to use it right then and there. They find mm -hmm. value in it. There's a pen in there. They have, you know, uh, those things. Um, again, it's really cool space that you're doing now. Now for folks that are interested, and again, folks, this information will be on the shades of E. So please subscribe to the newsletter. So Jeremy, if folks are interested in learning more about you, learning more about swag space, where can they find you online? Where do they go? Sure thing. So if you're looking to buy swag for yourself or your company, check out swag.com. Um, if you're looking to create your own swag platform to sell to an audience, check out swag.space. It's not .com, it's swag.space. Uh, you can email me. I still have my old email, jeremy at swag.com is my email. Reach out. Love to work with you. Any of the platforms that you reach out to. Awesome. Jeremy Parker with swag.com. Again, folks, all this information will be available on the shades of e.com. So please subscribe to the newsletter. You can also follow us on the social sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, and uh, Instagram. Again, Jeremy, I really appreciate your, uh, your time today. Again, folks, this information will be on the shades of e.com. We'll write up a newsletter as well as a blog post. We'll have some backlinks to swag space as well as swag.com. So for those that are interested in, in connecting with Jeremy and learning more about this business, I would highly encourage you to check out swag space because again, it's a, it's a soft kind of takeoff for a lot of entrepreneur and a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors. So again, folks that are interested, please visit the shades of e.com. Thank you and have a great night.